Network. Oh, all right. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. This is a little odd. I feel very lonely up here by myself and this big light in my eyes. So, uh, so yeah, thanks for coming in. I, um, I don't really have anything super formal. I'm just going to kind of babble along about some of the stuff we've been working on, and we'll try some beers. So I'm pretty hopeful that you guys are all going to have some questions so we can kind of drive the conversation. Um, you know, we're here to talk about spontaneously fermented beers, our cool ship beers that we make at Allagash. But I'm more than happy to ask, answer questions about some of the other beers we make. You know, we make a bunch of other beers in the kind of wild and sour vein that aren't necessarily spontaneous fermentation beers. And of course, as you probably know, we make lots of beers that are, you know, tame beers, non-wild beers. So happy to talk about any or all of them as much as, as, much as you guys are interested. But, but yeah, we, we, we just, uh, you know, I just want to take a minute to talk about, you know, this program that we started back in 2007, um, which is, a, you know, our cool ship program. So basically, you know, we started, you know, Algash started in 1995. Um, you know, Rob Todd started the brewery in 1995, making basically Allagash White to start with. Uh, and we, you know, slowly branched out into other beers, but they were all in the Belgian style vein. So right from the be very beginning, that, that was kind of the approach we were taking. And, you know, I always like to, to tell people, that especially, you know, pe people who, who live in markets where our Allagash White is poured and, and you know, we... We've managed to grow, and it's in it's in a lot of a lot of bars in various places. I always like to remind people that you know if you go back 15 years or more, uh, that was definitely not the case. It was a huge struggle for us to sell that beer. You know, Allagash White was a beer that no one knew any you know no one knew why beer was cloudy or smelled funny or anything like that. So it was a real struggle for us. And I only bring that up now because you know we kind of view you know we've always kind of taken this approach of I guess innovation or or you know, doing something different. And that's always been kind of our approach from the get-go, even with a beer like Allagash White, which is now 80% of what we make and, you know, available in a lot of places. Um, so that kind of led us, I guess, you know, to shorten the story up real quick to, to, to the Cool Ship series. So, so we've been making Belgian-style beers um, for about 12 years at that point. And it tried a bunch of different things. We had done some stuff with Britannomyces. We had done some stuff with um, lactic acid bacteria, barrel aging. But we really felt like, what, wouldn't it be fun to kind of see if we could produce, you know, spontaneously fermented beers in Portland, Maine, in the same fashion that it's been historically done in the greater Brussels uh, area in Belgium, you know? And at that time in 07, um, it really was kind of the conventional wisdom that you could only make lambic style beers in the true in the spontaneous fashion within some magical radius of Brussels in Belgium. Um, you know, the magical Seine River that runs through that area, some people would say, or, or whatever it was. Uh, and that was just kind of the, what people thought. And, and we, we just kind of said, well, let's see if that's actually the case. Let's see if we can, we can make these beers in a totally different part of the world. Um, modeled, so we modeled the process very much after Lambic production. So, you know, we, we make the beer in a lot of the same way in that we use unmalted wheat. We use a you know, very vigorous turbid mash schedule. So we're really trying to leach as much as we can out of the, out of the mash, you know, tannins and polyphenols, et cetera, starches, uh, you know, non-conventional brewing for sure. Not what most people are doing, including all the other beers we make. Uh, we use um, aged tops as well, and we use a cool ship. So um, I assume if you're in this room, you probably have a decent idea of what a cool ship is. But I'll give the you know 10 second explanation, um, and you guys can start pouring those beers if you want. I think people are probably getting thirsty. So we're starting with Cool Shipper Sergum, which I'll, I can talk about in a second, and I might I'll probably gonna bounce around really sporadically here with my thoughts. So p pardon me. Um, if you ever have a if you have a question right in the middle of something, I don't mind if you just raise your hand and shout it out. We don't have to wait till the end. So, um, all right, we've already got two in the back. Yeah, so the question was, did we travel to Belgium to, to kind of get tips on the process, I guess? Um, yes, but only limitedly. You know, we, we had some, um, some interaction with um, Frank Bone at Bone and, and more interaction with Jean at Cantillon. Um, Jean especially was very intrigued by the concept of, of us trying it in, in Portland, Maine. I mean, I think he, 
we kind of thought, you know, they're very proud. They have a very proud brewing tradition over there, and we and we were a little worried that we, you know, offend Belgians that we were, you know, basically stealing their process. Uh, and I'm sure we probably did a few folks, but uh, Jean Acantian, uh, who was, who as people who know Acantian probably know, they're they're kind of this cool split of traditional lambic brewing, you know, Goose uh, Creek and Frambois, but they're also really pushing the limits of of spontaneous fermentation in a lot of other ways. And that really comes from from Jean, who really wants to continue to try new things. So, so when we reached out to him and, and started asking him questions, it was very much an open dialogue. He's very intrigued by the by the concept. So he, you know, was an open book and shared with us what what it was that he was doing over there. Um, as far as design of the cool ship, that was kind of just uh, basically practicality. At the time, the brewery uh, we had very little space to expand. Um, very little space to expand and so we had like a small little block of that we could put uh, impermeable surface down on and so we basically built that and said about how big a beer uh, vessel can we put here and it ended up being about 20 barrels uh, you know about 20 inches deep um, but I, I it's not like there was a ton of research that went into exactly that shape um, so so anyway so just real quick on a cool ship just so everyone kind of knows what it is uh you know i always like to tell people that you know a cool ship which is now mostly the few that are in the world both in in belgium and in the u.s are mostly used for producing spontaneous fermentation but that's not really what they were invented for i mean they were invented centuries and centuries ago to basically cool work you know back if you go back centuries before they really knew what yeast was um you know you, you hear the stories about how you know beer was discovered and Mesopotamia or wherever it was by accident, you know, people left grain outside, it got rained on, it, you know, caught wild yeast in the air, fermented, delicious, etc. cetera. Um, well, fast forward a bunch of years, over the years, the brewers kind of figured out techniques to make, make their beer or their alcohol more consistent. And, you know, one of those was they figured out if they cool this, if they cool their liquid down quickly from the hot point to the to the fermentation point, it's you know made it more consistent, more predictable. So there was a lot of crude means that they devised to to cool wort down, and one of them was a cool ship. Just simple idea, high surface area. You know, it basically looks like a big brownie pan, if you will. So you put the wort in there. It's got lots of surface area. The wort cools down quickly, uh, quicker than it would just sitting in a big full vat. So that's what they were really used for, and for all kinds of brewing for who knows how long, for a long period of time. They were one of the means uh, for cooling word. Uh, well, what happened when uh, you know, people like uh, Hansen and um, Pasteur made discoveries around yeast, uh, all of a sudden people knew what yeast was, they knew what it did, uh, and you know, f in a fairly quick period of time, breweries went to closed, closed cooling setups, single cell fermentations, et cetera, et cetera. And so cool ships then became not the way to brew, not a clean way to brew. So they basically went away. The only ones that remained were the ones uh, that were used for spontaneous fermentation. So with the use of a cool ship, you're basically taking your wort from the brew house after boiling, uh, and instead of cooling it through a heat exchanger or some kind of closed mechanical cooling, you send it to this brownie pan uh, at full boiling temperature, and it cools in that vessel. Uh, for us, it's about 18 hours. We have very specific times a year we do it. We basically do it in late October, November, early December. And in that time frame uh, is when we get cooling in about 18 hours. We get the mi right microbes that we want. So you get cooling, and you also get basically inoculation of uh, resident local uh, ye microbes, wild yeast, Britannomyces, um, bacteria, et cetera. And uh, from there, the beer goes right into barrels for two to three years of fermentation and aging. So. So spontaneous fermentation is, of course, a little bit of a silly word. Uh, there's really no such thing. Wild fermentation is probably would be more accurate. Uh, but the word is used to, to designate where absolutely no yeast is added other than through natural means of cooling and nothing else. So, uh, Have you, I guess, studied what exactly you is in the like the um, different uh, organisms that actually you pick up have you guys tested things to see what actually you're getting and either isolate or not isolate what they are yeah that's a great question so I'll kind of answer that in two ways and one is 
to go back in time around 2004, we had a, a beer we were brewing in our brewery that got um, basically contaminated with Britannomyces un, uh, unintentionally. Um, and of course, we panicked in the short term. Uh, you know, we were even when at that size, we were running a, uh, all of our beer through uh, media for micro analysis. And, you know, it right away picked up Britannomyces. You could tell it smelled like Britannomyces. It wasn't supposed to be there. We were small. We panicked. We thought we were going to dump the beer. But then this like light bulb went off in our head. We're like, this actually is a, just a beautiful character here. Um, and we basically discovered what we now call Allagash bread or Britannomyces allegensis or Brett Michaels, some people call it. Um, so it's a strain of bread that we found at the brewery. Uh, and we now use that regularly. We, we have that isolated. We use that regularly in different beers. But I bring it up here because I often say that it was one of the things that kind of gave us some confidence to, you know, here we have, you know, Britannomyces is, of course, a huge component of Lambic style beers. And here we have a strain that we really liked that was just hanging about uh, in our brewery. So um, it's just one of one of several things. The second answer to that question, you know, I say we, we have a pretty good um, QC lab, but we don't have capability for true typing of, of organisms. We're just not that sophisticated. But we got pretty fortunate. And around 2008, we were only about a year into the project. We were contacted by a UC Davis grad student who heard we were doing it, was pretty passionate about um, about spontaneous beer. And so we worked with him. All we had to do was send him samples. We sent him samples for about two years of several batches, and he ran them through full analysis. So we have this great, um, he published the study. Uh, it's this is great progression. We have a very good idea of, of what's in there. We haven't gone to actually isolating that stuff and, and using it in other ways. I'd like to, but uh, we do have very good data on what's there. and. Uh, What's also interesting with that is there's been a couple very similar studies done on Belgian style Lambic, or Belgian Lambic, not style, but actually Belgian produced Lambic. One back in the 80s, and another one about two years ago, maybe even a year ago. And so we can kind of overlay our results over those. And in a nutshell, they're really similar, very similar progression of microbes. So. Question here? So kind of a two-parter. One, for, for a standard batch, I guess, how big are the cool ships and how many do you use for each batch? And then also, I was just curious how much variation there is from batch to batch, just with the nature of, of using you know, wild fermentation, like how much variation do you see between batches? Yeah, sure. So we, we, do, um, um, we brew about 20 barrel batches, 22 barrel batches. Um, and you know, we, it goes in the cool ship volumes about 22 barrels. But because of the nature of that evaporation, we get a tremendous amount. Because of the surface area, you get a tremendous amount of evaporation overnight. Um, you know, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but probably as much as 16 or 17 percent. So it evaporates a lot. Um, so it condenses the wort, makes it stronger. But also, I remember the first time we did it, and I think we had, I think we came out of the brew house at like 11 and a half Play-Doh or something like that. And the next day, we were at like 13 and a half. And I was like, how? How is this possible? And I was like, oh, yeah, we just evaporated all this water off. It's crazy. Um, so that's at the batch size. We, only, we put everything through the cool ship. Um, I know that there are some producers out there who will do a bigger batch and only cool a portion of the cool ship and just get their inoculation there just so they can make bigger batches. We've never played around with that. So everything goes through the cool ship. Um, consistent. Um, it, uh, it's getting more consistent, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, if you look just at fermentation time, the amount of time it takes to kick in fermentation, the first couple, ba just like on a visual, looking at a barrel, watching it you know, start to foam up, the first couple batches were somewhere as long as 10 or 15 days before you see any real vigorous fermentation. Now we're seeing it in two days, sometimes less. It really starts to kick in. So that tells us the microflora is building up in the room itself where the cool ship is. And, and producing more consistency there. Um, in the end, there's still variability, and sometimes it totally blows my mind. Like we had a, uh, I just sampled barrels a few weeks ago from just this past season. So we brew only in the fall. So this, you know, they're not quite a year old. And there's these two barrels on a rack, same batch. So same, same batch, like same, same night, same temperature, same wort, whatever. The barrels are even the same, you know, fresh to us from the same winery, held the same wine in them before. 
and they were like ridiculously different. One of them, I had to like bring brewers around and be like, you guys want to know what nail polish smells like in beer? Like this is nail polish. And like if you put it in front of somebody and said, what is this? They'd say nail polish remover. That's what they'd say. It was, um, and then the other one was beautiful. So there's, that doesn't happen a lot like that, but there is enough of that that still kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit. Um, you know, the, the key, you know, I like to say we do everything we can to keep the, to control what we can control. So, you know, we source the right raw materials, use, use those with consistency. We have the same process in the brew house. We, you know, brew at very certain times a year. We source the same barrels, et cetera. We temperature control the room. Uh, everything we can control, but there's things that are out of your control with this kind of brewing. And the last piece that helps us with that is the blending. Um, you know, I know um, with Resurgum, but uh, that first beer we tried is basically our uh, interpretation of a goose. So that is a true blended beer. That's a blend of uh, roughly one year old, two year old, and three year old spontaneously fermented beer, all the same base beer. Um, so, you know, it's not exactly that portion. That each portion is determined by flavor and, and mostly flavor, but a little bit based on uh, density as well. Um, so it's you know very similar to Goose in that fashion that it's a, you know young, uh, middle aged, and old age. Most of it's about fifty percent three year old in ours for the most part. That one year old really provides uh, healthy yeast and a little bit of sugar to help pre fermentation. So. Um, so especially with Resurgum, you get that blending piece where you can really kind of fine tune it and, and get the consistency there with blending. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some batches retain different characteristics when you do the spontaneous fermentation. How many or what percent would you think is just completely unusable even if you try to blend it? Because I know it's an inherent risk that you can get anything in there. So I, I would say, is it a risk when you're brewing this, or do you have to toss her in batches here and there? That's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, this, one of the sad parts about doing these kind of beers. And I think it's the case for all barrel-aged uh, wild fermentation beers, but even more the case with spontaneous fermentation beers. Uh, you know, part of the blending process is, is knowing what not to use. It's a huge part of it. It's probably the... And in some ways, the easiest part, because it's the easiest kind of selection. Uh, it's sad to see it go, you know, especially when it's two and a half, three years old. Um, but uh, it's definitely part. It has to be part of it. And, you know, stuff like, you know, ethyl acetate, solventy character, or, um, you know, acetic acid character that's really high, vinegar character, that stuff is pretty hard to, to blend out, especially the, sol the real solventy characters. Um, there is some you broke it, Jason. I, broke the, I broke the mic um, there is some characteristics we sometimes get um, sulfur is a bit like hydrogen sulfide is the character we get in barrels and that'll go away that's a pretty volatile aroma typically will go away um, diacetyl we occasionally get not a lot but sometimes um, that'll usually go away uh, isoamyl acetate, which is like, you know, banana clovey, like think uh, German Hefeweizen. Most of our beer gets that at the young age, and that kind of fades away. But stuff like acetic acid and, uh, and solvent character, uh, you know, those, those don't go away. And those, don't, those are really difficult to blend out. Yeah, do you see a seasonal variation in the wild uh microbes and is there a better time to do this uh, time of year yeah like I said earlier we, we have kind of honed in our time frame and it's it's a time frame and it's also a temperature that we've really found success with so when we first started brewing these beers we were brewing in the fall and the spring both and that was basically based on the concept here we are again once again trying to mimic um, production of lambic, which had been done for centuries, so they know it, they know how to do it. Let's kind of try to mimic that same thing in the U.S. So we we basically looked at weather patterns in Portland, Maine, and Brussels. And if you look at that on a graph, you'll see in the summer we're hotter, in the winter we're colder, but in the fall and the spring it's basically exactly the same temperature. 
and uh, over in Belgium, they'll brew, they'll start brewing in October or so and, and finish in April or so. Um, so they'll brew right through the winter, but they basically never get below freezing, not very often anyway, where we do a lot, basically the whole winter. So we kind of picked those two shoulder seasons as the right time to do it. But uh, for the, through the first handful of seasons, we just found, well, one, inconsistency in weather patterns in the spring. You know, you'd have, um, you know, it would be 15 Fahrenheit one day and 55 the next day. You'd have snow up to here, and then all of a sudden it'd be gone. So uh, just hard to predict brewing days. Um, but we also just found, we found more of that kind of uh, solventy character with all the batches that were done in the spring. Uh, we also started finding that temperature really was important for us. So we're basically only brewing when the overnight temperatures are somewhere between 28 Fahrenheit and 40 Fahrenheit. And if it falls, if it goes above that, we just will cancel the brew. We won't do the brew that day. You know, you're, you're playing with the weather and believe in the weatherman to, to do that. But um, I can't say what microbes that is, but I can tell you for sure that that overnight temperature we found has a pretty big effect in our, in our region, in our process. So I know, just real quick, let me just explain, because we've got a cup, I think you everyone got the second beer. So we, we, uh, we, we really at this point only make basically three beers with the same base wort. So all the beers you'll try today, it's the same, same recipe in the brew house. So um, same grains, et cetera, same, same beer really. Um, and we make resorgum, which we tried first, which is a blend of one, two, and three-year-old. And then we make two fruited beers, uh, basically our interpretation of a creek and our interpretation of a frambois. So cerise is with cherries. Um, we use local, local fruit in both cases. We basically exclusively use local fresh fruit in all of our, all of our beers. Um, and uh, in the case of cerise, it's local cherries. We basically work with one farmer because um, tart cherries is not a common uh, crop in Maine by any means, but there's basically one guy who's more or less our personal cherry farmer because he, uh, he used, he's a pick-your-own uh, farmer, uh, and he had a handful of cherry trees. We started buying them from him, and he keeps planting more and more, and he keeps trying to get enough cherries in place that other people can get cherries, but we keep asking for more. So he's basically our personal cherry farmer, which is kind of nice. Um, and then red, which we'll try, uh, is so once again, same base beer. It's about two year old cool ship beer with raspberries added. So um, about two pounds per, per gallon or so. So pretty heavy. Uh, some spontaneous brewers pre acidify before going into the cool ship. Uh, is that something that you do or have experimented with just to ward off Anterobacter, anything weird and gross? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have tried it. We did it with one batch. Um, so yeah, the theory there is some of the bacteria you get early, very in the first day or two, that um, before alcohol is created for pH drops, is stuff like Enterobacter, which you know isn't something people necessarily want to consume. Um, and so the idea is you acidify your wort um, to a point. I think you know 4.5, 4.7. I forget exactly what we did. Uh, that makes it uh, you know, unsuitable for those. Um, we, we, we did it once, um, and we monitored a bunch of things, fermentation speed, flavor, um, something called biogenic amines, which is something that's produced by Enterbacker. It's a good indicator of their presence. And we basically saw no benefit to it, no detriment to flavor either. But um, you know, I think probably a lot of that is that we're, like I mentioned earlier, our fermentations are quite quick and quite vigorous. So is there some Enterobacter in there in the day one? Yes, but it's gone very quickly. I mean, that's one of the things that they track for us in that study, and you could really see, you know, as soon as pH does this on a graph and alcohol does this, it's right, right in, I mean, it's like half a percent alcohol and it's gone, but. There. You told us that the, um, the batches you're brewing are 20 barrels. Can you tell us how the dimensions of your cool ship? Um, I don't know them exactly. I can tell you depth is about 22 to 24 inches. And we started initially with smaller batches, um, just thinking we'd need more surface area. So we were probably originally maybe 15 or 16 inches deep, but then we got greedy for more beer, so we just 
now it's literally totally like spilling over the top full. Do, when do you add the fruit? Do you put the fruit into the barrels or do you add the fruit into, the fruit into a bright tank after you blend? Yeah, great, a great question. We, we, uh, we've done it both. Um, we originally, so the fruit, like I mentioned earlier, it's about, for us it's about two years or so uh, in the barrel without fruit. Um, sometimes a little bit longer. Like I said, it's all f flavor driven, so we might let it l linger longer if we feel it needs it. Um, but fruit season is a specific time of year, of course, for us, because we only use fresh fruit, so it has to happen in, in July, basically. Um, so we did initially add them to a barrel, so we would take an empty barrel, add all the fruit to that, and then and basically transfer that beer back into that barrel full of uh, fruit. Um, we did that really out of necessity because we didn't have other vessels available. We were dealing with really small. We were doing like two barrels at a time, two oak barrels at a time. But it was such a pain. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pain to get the fruit into the barrel. It's a pain to get it out of the barrel. Uh, that barrel, no matter what you do to it, steam clean it, heat it clean, especially with raspberries, it forever has a tinge of raspberry flavor to it. Um, so we, I found myself basically managing you know, which barrels to use and how much to put fruit in from each batch and all that, and, and not to mention the, the pain of dealing with it. And in the end, it's just not necessary because when, you're f when your beer is ready for fruit, it's, it doesn't need the barrel anymore. The barrel doesn't serve that purpose, in my opinion, doesn't serve that purpose anymore. So what we've moved towards with basically all of our fruit beers, except for the small experimental stuff, into some kind of stainless steel tank. So we've got, we've got uh, some like 30 barrel tanks. We've even got some 90 barrel tanks for some of the, not for these beers, we don't make enough of them, but some of the other beers we make on fruit. Uh, we're pouring a beer farm to face at our booth today, which is on peaches. That was in a 90 barrel fruited tank because we had lots of peaches to use. Um, they're horizontal dairy tanks, which is nice, advantageous for the contact on, on the beer itself. So it's, it's a really spread out uh, surface area. Um, for the cool ship beers, we're dealing with smaller volumes. So we're using these 500 gallon totes. They're stainless, they're mobile. Well, mo we've never moved them full. I'm sure you could, but they're mobile when they're empty at least. Um, they're not jacketed, but that's okay as we keep them in a temperature control room. They got a manway on top, they got a manway on bottom, they're perfect. Um, I think you were asking about stirring them. Um, we have in some cases, but we haven't, for the most part, haven't found it necessary. Um, we just did it recently in a beer where, but that was more a beer where we had to add the fruit over like a three or four week period of time because it was getting to us slowly from farmers. But for the most part, fruit goes in first, beer goes in behind it, and then we just leave it. Especially with those horizontal tanks, it just doesn't seem necessary. That's it? That's it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I jumped up here with it. Jason Perkins, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, talking with us and sharing beer, Jason. Uh, great guy, right? Excellent beer. Uh, that's some of the best uh, uh, spontaneous fermentation beer in the U.S., in, in my opinion. You're going to hear from the founder of uh, Allagash a little later today. Rob Todd's going to be up here uh, talking about why independence in beer matters at, at 8.30. And we got another panel coming up in a half an hour talking to you about uh, everybody's favorite style, the IPA. So hang out, go have some beer, come back, whatever you want to do. Thanks for being with us. I appreciate it.